Hi and welcome to DCL. My name is David Copete and in today's video I'm going to share with you the entire process for creating this script. It's going to be a set of I-beams and what's cool about this is that you can set this to any line segment or a group of curves. Let me show you here if we create a line segment here we can set that as a curve and then use this as the input. We can also rotate its location if we want it to be at the top or at the bottom and change all of the details with the sliders here. So with that being said, hopefully you're excited to see what this is all about. It's going to be a really useful one for those of you who want to create scripts for your designs. And so let's get right into it. If you get stuck somewhere, you'll be able to download this from my website along with the cleaned up um, cluster version. But like I said, thank you for being here and let's jump into the tutorial. All right, so the first thing we need to do for this video is create a base geometry. Now, what I'm going to do is do it here in Rhino and then bring in those curves into Grasshopper. So I'll go here in Rhino, type in arc. I'll go to start point, end point, and the direction or the height of it. Then I'm going to rotate these so they're upright. So rotate 3D. Now there's different ways we can do this, but I'm showing you kind of a cool way to be able to take these, rotate it up. And now we're going to create more than one because the idea is that we can set multiple curves and apply the design to it. I'll bring this up. And now inside of Grasshopper, I'll double click here and go to a curve component. This is going to bring an empty point component that we can take these right click on it and go to set multiple curves now we can take this and hide it and now we'll be starting with these so now that we have the base geometry inside of grasshopper what we need to do is create a plane a reference plane where the design is going to be made so what i'll do here is create a perpendicular frame i'll use those curves as the input and the parameter will be one. So we can change it from zero to one. Now one here, we first need to reparameterize. So now it can be created at the beginning or at the end. We'll choose here zero. It actually doesn't really matter because we're going to be sweeping these along that curve. So now that we have the reference planes, let's pick one and create the design around it. This way we can then apply it to the rest when we graft it. And so we'll go here to list item. We'll also make sure to graft the input here. The reason why, or the curves. The reason why is because we do want to do it to all of them. But here at the beginning, or here with the list item, we'll flatten it just to do it to one. And then we'll take off the flattened list to apply it to all of them. All right, so now with this, we're going to hide the other reference planes. We'll just focus on this one. And notice that the reference plane is, this is going to be the X, this is going to be the Y, and Z is going to either be this way or the opposite way. What we're going to do is move some points around to create the design. So starting here with the reference plane, we're going to deconstruct it so we know the x, y, and z directions for that plane. 
Then we're going to take the origin and then we're going to extract the point because this is where we're going to start everything. So now that we have this point, we're going to move it in the y direction and negative y direction. So I'll bring in a move component. And rather than using the world XY, I'll be using an amplitude component using the Y axis. Now, what, I'll, what we're doing here is moving it to one side and then to the other side. And I want to be able to just use one number. So I'll use here, let's say 12. Let's create some decimal points, 12.000. Now I'll plug in the vector into the motion. And notice that it moves it by 12. Now what I needed to do is divide by two because we're going to be moving it six in one direction and then six in the other direction. So I'll copy this one, use a negative, and that way we can use that point as the center point. Now I'm going to decrease this a little bit. And also, if you don't like, well, for me, I don't really like the spacing for this. So I'm going to show those curves and I'm going to scale them. Obviously, depending on what curve you want to use as the input, you can, you know, you can have that as your default here. Okay, so now that we have these points moved, we're going to take those points and move them in the positive x direction. And that's going to be now using this. So let's copy this over. But we don't need to use the half because we're moving this down for the actual depth of it. So now we'll take this, copy it down, override the half and then use the X input. Now we can take these two, copy them, override the geometry input, and move both of those down by the same amount. Now we're going to be creating the midpoint between the two here. So for that, we'll use an average component. And when I plug in these two into it, now we have the midpoint that is corresponding to this origin point. And we can also take this point or this movement and then just move the original one. So those are two different ways of doing it. I think this is a bit of a cleaner way to do it. All right, next we need to create another movement. And this is going to create the flange size. So we'll take these and we moved it down by this much. Now we're going to once again, move it down. I'll copy the vector and the slider so I can change the slider here to be a lower number because the flange size is going to be, you know, not too big. Make it one or 0.5. And then we're going to take those points that we moved down and move them up by the same amount. So I'll copy that, plug in the geometry into the input, and move them, not in the positive, but in the negative direction. So I'll use a negative component to change that vector in the negative direction. 
and then use that as the input for them here. So all we're doing here is moving points relative to the deconstructed plane. Now what we need to do is move the, origi the original point or the origin point down the same amount. So we'll go to move, or we can copy the move component. Just trying to create some space here. The move component and plug in the origin point and do the same thing with these and move this point, which is the origin point that was moved all the way down. And rather than using positive here, we're going to be using the negative one. Now next we need to create the web depth, which is going to be in the positive Y and negative Y, but we're also need to make sure that it has to be centered by dividing the overall size by half. So I'll copy this down, change the max like I did in the other one. And let's make this one again, 0.5. So now we can take this point and the origin point that we moved down for the flange depth and move it in the positive Y and negative Y relative to the deconstructed plane. So we'll move. This one. And since it's going both ways, we'll copy this and then go to negative. So now we can take this one and hide it. So we don't, because we don't need it. Now we'll copy these two and do it again, but to this one. So I'll actually move it down here. So using this point, we can plug those in. So all we're doing here, once again, is moving the points relative to the plane. And we have now the depth for the flange, the depth for the web, and now we need to connect them. But there's an additional detail here, which is going to be a fillet radius for this intersecting points. So the important thing is now to connect this one to this one, this one to this one, and this one to this one. So now we need to see how things are organized here because it can start getting a little bit confusing. So the most important thing is to bring in a line segment. And now we're going to be connecting all of the different points. So starting with this point, and that's going to now connect to this one in here, which has been, which is this one. So the start point and end point. Now we could also use a polyline, so just keep that in mind. But I like doing it like this so I can then join those specific ones um, and it gets a little bit trickier to plug in a polyline because you don't necessarily know the order of it when later on you are going to see that we're going to join them all together into one and that's a little bit easier to understand here so there's different approaches to this just keep that in mind now this one 
is going to be this one connecting to this one. Then we have these two. So we're going to do one at a time. This is going to be the end point. And the start point is going to be this one. And now the logic here is that this one is at the top and then this one at the bottom. Now we're going to be connecting the two endpoints, these two. So let's go now to this one and this one. So I'll copy a line segment, use this as the start, this as the end. And similar to that, this is going to be the start, and this one is going to be the end. So with those, we can join those together. So I like to keep this organized by clicking on this middle one, then to the right, and then we're going to join together all of these. So it says two separate polylines, which makes sense because these are two separate ones. We're going to flatten the input regardless. And then here, go to a fillet, which will create a radius at the intersection. Which makes this one the old curve. Now we need to connect these two to create that overall line segment. And connect these two. Actually, no, it's going to be those two at the top. And then, let's see. These two. So now we can bring these over and we can still use these two points that we kind of moved. Let's see here. These two and connect them to those two. And the other way is going to be just getting the endpoints of these two and connecting up to the endpoints of these two. So there are different ways of doing this. We're going to now take a line segment. And I'm just showing you start and end point and how to just connect the points here.
All right, so it's going to be these two. And these two. Then create another line segment connecting the two remaining ones. So these two, those were down here. So let's do these two, two, And then these two. Okay, it's going to be this one first. Then this one. And connect now this one. to the next one. But now using a join curves, we're going to join the fillet radius one in the middle and then holding down shift, add all the other ones. Now it could get a little confusing doing it this way because we have a lot of different points, but you can also label them so you know, you know, you can start here and saying this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. And that way you can kind of know which ones go where. I'm showing you here how to just connect them using the start and end point. Now here, I'll just use a curve component. So we know that this is going to be the output. And I like to group it. And then I have by default this color, but you can add any color you want. So now we need to see how this applies to all the other ones. So we'll go here to list item. And this is really the power of parametric design is being able to apply all of these steps to all the other curves. And so here we flattened it for one. So we're going to remove that. Now notice that it creates the reference plane at the end of all of those. And now we can sweep that. So using this, and using the curve input, these, we're going to now sweep along this rail, these sections. Now here, notice that this one is a flattened list and this is grafted. So we do need to make sure we graft this one. And since when you sweep something, it's still going to keep this open. We're going to now take this and cap the start and end. And the cool thing is that we can type in show, bring in these curves, F10 for control points and even get crazy here. And notice that it'll do that to the entire thing and we can still change all of the inputs here. So six is going to be the overall width. So we'll go here, six, 12 for the depth. We can change just one of these to be different.
Now, here's the only thing that I noticed that we need to still adjust here is that if we rotate this, sometimes if we bring in, let's say, a straight line segment, we copy this over a few times, you're going to see that sometimes the orientation of where the perpendicular frame, how it's created, it's going to switch the direction. So let's set multiple curves here. And notice that now here it's created from the bottom to the top here. But now what we need to do is create a modification so we can rotate this around to any direction. So what we'll do here is take this perpendicular frame, you see rotate, use that perpendicular frame that's grafted as the plane input. Now we're going to take these curves, plug them in, and for the angle, we'll change it to degrees. And what I like to do is create a value list to have only three different options. You can have more, of course, but what we'll do is when you create a value list, it's going to, by default, have some numbers in here. The first one should be zero, which is no rotation. The second one is going to be 90, which is 90 degrees, and then 180, which flips it all the way around. And then here we can do minus 90. So we can do, do it like this. This one's going to be zero. This one's going to be 90. The next one will be minus 90. And then we'll equals minus 90. And I'll show you how this works, which is actually a really good way to control the numbers you want to use if that's something you need to do. And then this one is going to be 180. I do like to keep them organized like this so they're all lining up. Okay, this is going to be what you'll see in the slider. And this is the number that's going to be output. This is going to be, like I said, the number that you see displayed and this is going to be the output so i have them matching and the reason why is because when you hit okay now we can pick between 0 90 minus 90 and 180 and we can change the name of this value list to be rotation so now it's going to rotate by zero and so you do have to make sure that it says degrees then 90 then minus 90 if you want the other way and then 180. of course you can also use a slider and change the slider input but now what we need to do is override so i'll copy this curve component bring it here and override this curve which i'll ungroup i'll group this one and use that as the section and the reason for this is because if you think about it sometimes you're going to have it be straight lines that you want to use and so when we plug these in now they'll set multiple curves notice that now it's rotated all the way around which means that we'll go back to this one and change it to zero And the cool thing about this is that it's always going to work because it's relative to the perpendicular frame that is made at the start of the curve. So this is going to be a really useful tutorial to show you guys how you can use these parametric tools to program designs like structures or whatever design and be able to set your own geometry to save some time later on because it does take some time to work out some of these scripts but once you do have it worked out then you can use these and save a lot of time or even share them with people that will find them useful 
So what you'll see at the end of today's video or of this video is an entire work session where I work out the script, this design, and I also cleaned it up into a cluster. This way you have not this entire thing like this, but you'll have the organized version that you can download as well. So thank you very much for being here. Hopefully you found this useful and you learned a few more things. Um, and I hope to see you in the next video. Jack it up.